I have the great honor and privilege today of introducing to you my friend and our preacher for the weekend, the Reverend Hester Mathis. Hester is the Senior Associate Rector of the Church of the Holy Communion, that wonderful Episcopal church that I drive by four or five times a day on the corner of Walnut Grove and Perkins. She's the head of programming there, which includes so many things. It includes formation for children, for youth, for adults, sports and recreation, outreach, as well as interfaith and ecumenical relationships. And that's kind of how Rufus and I have gotten to know Hester through our association with the Memphis Christian Pastors Network. Hester was born and raised in Memphis. She got her undergrad degree in music at the College of William and Mary and her Masters of Divinity at Virginia Theological Seminary. Hester is married to Andy and they have two fabulous children Neely, who is a freshman at TCU, and Xander, who is a sophomore at the Memphis University School. And so please join me with a big hope welcome to Reverend Hester Mathis. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Pastor Eli, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to Pastor Rufus for the generous invitation to be here with all of you today. The more that we can spread the good news and be a part of the good news across denominational lines, the better, because we are the full body of Christ. I bring greetings from Church of the Holy Communion, that Episcopal church right down Walnut Grove that shares a campus with St. Mary's Episcopal. I grew up here in Memphis, but it took moving away from Memphis to college for me to really start to appreciate what I had in my own hometown. I thought I was going to study classical piano and the more I learned about where I came from, the more I found myself drawn to the music of this region, and most specifically, the Delta Blues. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how that continues to inform my spiritual journey even to this day. I now live just right up the street off of Rocky Point, so I too get to pass by Hope very, very often, and I say a prayer for you each time that I do. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Eli said, Hope is a window seat church. When you're on a plane, you can either sit on the aisle where you can see more of what's happening inside, or you can sit at the window where you have a full view of what is outside of those walls. And I will tell you that as a person of this community, Hope is a window seat church. This is not the first time I've been on this stage. Uh, the first time was when I was a teacher at St. George's Independent School and we lost our ability to have our talent show because of an ice storm. And so a week later, you very, very graciously opened your doors so that we could lift up the gifts and talents of all of our students on this stage. So the first time I was here, it was dancing to Katy Perry's fireworks. The second time I got to be a part of the consecration of our bishop, Bishop Phoebe, who's going to be here with you on Ash Wednesday. And when we realized that so many people would want to be a part of her consecration, we knew that our cathedral could not hold them all. And again, you opened your doors to our community and allowed us to have that momentous occasion right here. So I thank you for that. It's through the Memphis Christian Pastors Network that I've gotten to know both Pastor Rufus and Pastor Eli, and I will tell you that this entire city is a better place because of the connections that they are making possible through all the faith leaders of our city. And it's big. It's wonderful to get to be in deeper relationship for, with, with one another so that then when something happens, we have each other to lean on and to brainstorm with and to think how can we shine God's light in this moment together. 
Now, some people will say that they felt the call to seminary, and I would say that I fought the call to ordain ministry, not to ministry as a whole, because I believe that we all have a ministry, but I definitely did try everything else before I answered the call to be in ordained ministry, which in my denomination looks like wearing this little collar around your neck. Now, I am a walking witness to the persistence of the Holy Spirit and to what it looks like when she speaks through the voices of people that we love and we trust and we admire. So today, as we talk about that theme, living out loud, the bold wisdom of James, we get to explore what it means to tame our tongues. And I'm up here as a witness to what it looks like when other people use their words as blessing, to lift and to encourage. But that doesn't mean that I'm immune to what it means when people use their words as curse. There was a saying when I was younger, and you probably all know it, if you do, you can join in. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt me. Well, I grew up in Midtown. I went to Idlewild Elementary, a large co-ed public school, and it was in seventh grade that I transferred to the small private all-girls school of St. Mary's. You could say that I experienced a little bit of culture shock and I had braces, and I had frizzy hair, I had the whole works. It was the second week that I went into my home room that I saw on the blackboard at the front of that room, I eta retza. Now it took me a while, but I noticed that everyone was looking at me, and I realized that those words were I hate Hester backwards. And let me tell you, in that moment, my friends, words can hurt you. In the words of James, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. The tongue is small, but it yields great power. And in itself, that is not a bad thing. I like the motto, small but mighty. But with great power comes great responsibility. I read a story a couple of weeks ago that really brought this image to life. It was about a little farm just down the road in Como, Mississippi, called Home Place Pastures. And this is actually a farm that I highly recommend because they're at our farmer's markets and they really are committed to sustainable and responsible and humane farming in our area. At the end of January, they think that a small cigarette butt, perhaps tossed carelessly out of the window of a truck passing by, set blaze to one of their pastures. It took every staff member who was present that day, the USDA Forest Service, and the Como firefighters to put out that blaze. And by the end, it had burned through 80 bales of hay. Now, thank goodness, they caught it early, and they were able to save all the nearby farm equipment and the barn that was close by. But one tiny cigarette butt caused mass destruction. I will tell you that those three words, I eta retza, felt like a fire burning in my soul and felt like it caused more destruction than just a few little words could do. 
Again, in the words of James, with the tongue, we bless the Lord and Father. And with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? How is it that the same member of our body can have both blessing and curse? Well, I'll tell you, it's because as humans, we experience the full range of emotions, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But as people of faith, we are called to do the hard work between feeling those emotions and expressing those emotions to the people around us. I'd like to share with you a video by your own Teresa Hall Franklin, who does a hard work and a firsthand work of helping people when they're dealing with their anger and finding healthy ways to express their frustrations and their hard emotions so that their tongues don't add fuel to the fire. I was convinced I needed an internship before I graduated with my bachelor's. So they paired me with Charlotte Freeman uh, at the Exchange Club Family Centers, now the Kendrick Center. She needed some help in teaching anger management to kids, and she said, you're young enough that they can relate to. I, I was maybe 21, 22, and that's what we did. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I don't know anything about anger management, but as I started working on the program and helping her to modify it somewhat and adding different activities and assignments for the kids, I was like, man, I'm gonna try some of this, you know, and see if it works because I had never, you know, been to an anger management program. Originally, I thought it was just for me to teach someone else how to deal with anger. You know, as I started to process it and use it myself, I was like, everyone needs this. You know, anyone who holds in anger and stews on it or goes to bed angry or, you know, just kind of sweeps it underneath the rug, anger management is a need. Just the common person, it's anger is so natural and normal. It's a human emotion, you know, and it's something that can be better controlled, but we're all gonna experience it at some point in time. Some of the challenges that people face when they are initially getting started is um, a lack of support, a lack of, is there enough time? You know, they feel like it's too late, uh, I've got to hurry up and save my marriage tonight, you know, that sort of thing. Will I be able to do it? Almost just feeling defeated. And taming the tongue, self-care is so important in dealing with anger and managing emotions uh, because it gives you an outlet, you know, so whether it's a walk or a jog or playing volleyball or, you know, taking a hot shower, you need that time to like filter out a lot of the frustration so that you're not speaking in haste or saying things that are offensive or uh, degrading to someone. And that does happen when anger builds up and there's no outlet, no constructive outlet. So self-care and then also empathy. We talk a lot about empathy uh, is similar to a bridge connecting Tennessee and Arkansas. Yeah, you can get to Arkansas in another form or fashion, but it's gonna take longer. So if you can take the bridge or look at it as a bridge as a connection to someone else. And so when you think about that, it's like how fragile that you know bridge is and that connection is, you know, just a split second, you can say some things that literally destroys uh, a meaningful, very important relationship to you. So that's why taming the tongue and dealing with um, anger constructively is so important. I love her story. And it's so important to all of us. You know, as Rufus, Pastor Rufus said last week, we all face trials. And sometimes we face multiple trials at the same time. But if we consider joy in the midst of those trials and remember God's love for us and for those around us, 
then that can help us to endure. It can also help us to find healthy ways to speak our truth during these trials. And then we can use our words as blessing and not as curse. So here is the truth, because my, the girl who wrote, I eat Taretza on that blackboard, and I eventually became very good friends. And she shared with me years later what had happened that day that she chose to write that in our classroom. She said her mother, every day on the drive to school, had said to her, Marianne, my friend has a daughter who's starting at St. Mary's this year, and I want you to be nice to her. I want you to make her feel welcome. And she was dealing with all of her own middle school stuff and all of those things that teenagers and moms deal with in those wonderful, glorious years. And she was frustrated and she was angry and she lashed out. Perhaps if she had had Pastor Chad's questions in her heart, she might have asked herself, is it good for me? Is it good for them? And does this bring anyone closer to Jesus. Perhaps if she had had the wisdom of Pastor Rufus and considered joy in the midst of all of those seventh grade anxieties, she might have been able to voice it in a different way. Or if she had spent some time with Teresa Hall Franklin learning about outlets to help her process, time to filter, and empathy to help herself imagine what it felt like to be in my shoes as a new girl. Then maybe it wouldn't have taken her years to speak her truth in love. But you know what? God's power and grace heals all. And I am firmly convinced that had she shared that with me at that time, I, I mean, I get it. If you ask anyone that you know what time of life they would like to relive, I can guarantee you seventh grade is not the most popular answer. <laughs> it's hard. And we all experience hard emotions. But we can gain some wisdom from Ephesians. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is ahead, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Speaking the truth in love is not saying only what other people want to hear. It is important for us to name our emotions and to face them so that they don't fester and bubble out in harmful ways. It's important for us to learn how to lean into the awkwardness of that because there are loads of models out there that teach us how to lash out when we're angry but there are very few that teach us what to do with that anger and how to speak it and name it in loving ways. That's why I love the book of Psalms. I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but it is my favorite book of the Bible. Because the Psalms tell us that it is okay to name all those ugly emotions, anger, oppression, anxiety, fear, sickness, despair, and doubt. But we name them in a community of faith. And we name them all the while acknowledging God's love and power. They teach us how to say, your plans, God, are bigger than my trials. Your love is bigger than my weakness. So I'm putting it all out there while praising you. So 
So, if you are as tired as I am of the word unprecedented, Psalms can teach us otherwise. The Psalms of lament name grave illness. They name oppression, dislocation from loved ones, grief, envy, and despair. All of it is right there for us. It might feel new in our times, but these emotions and these trials are not new in the journey of God's people. And our ancestors teach us how to speak our truth with our eyes fixed on God. So I'll go back to my journey for a little while. As I mentioned before, my undergrad was in music and most specifically in the Delta Blues. So when I went to seminary at Virginia Theological, I took a class called Psalms and the Negro Spirituals. And in it, I learned how our ancestors used those psalms to name their trials in a community of faith using music. It was a healthy outlet for all of those complicated emotions. And while blues grew out of spirituals, they are not necessarily sacred in nature, but they too are lament named in community using music. So as I sat there in class, I couldn't help but notice that some of the same poetic devices are used in the Psalms as we use today in the blues. And it'll probably sound familiar to you. I'm gonna tell you something, then I'm gonna tell you again to make sure you're listening, and then I'm gonna drive it home with even bigger words. Make sure you're paying attention. So I started hearing the Psalms in the form of the 12 bar blues that I had spent so much time with in college and growing up. And last year I got to spend three months of a sabbatical exploring what those Psalms might look like brought to life as 12 bar blues with local Memphis musicians. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of example of how we can take this ancient scripture and explore it in a new and more modern way by using Psalm 69. And first I'll read to you a few verses. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. More in number than the hairs on my head are those who hate me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me, my enemies who accuse me falsely. What I did not steal must I now restore. I am lowly in pain. Let your salvation, O God, protect me. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. So now I'm gonna demonstrate what this might sound like were we to go down on Beale Street and hear it today. And forgive me because I am no B.B. King, but you can use your imagination. Save me, O oh God, for I sink in the waters deep. Save me, O oh God, for I sink in the waters deep. I'm sinking in the mire as the flood waters swallow me. My enemies outnumber me and hate me without pause. My enemies outnumber me and hate me without pause. They try to destroy me for the things I did not cause. I'm suffering in pain, oh my God, please protect me. I'm suffering in pain, oh my God, please protect me. I will praise your name and lift it up in thanksgiving. The Psalms are a resource 
handed down to us from our ancestors that teach us how to process the full range of human emotions. We can explore scripture in new ways and that can help us to bring it into our time and into our place. It helps us learn how to tame our tongue so that we too can speak our truth in love. So what does it look like to speak our truth in love with tamed tongues when the power goes out? When we're watching the Super Bowl later today? When we're frustrated at home? When the next COVID wave hits? When we deal with that troublesome client? When our flight is canceled? or when we drive right out of that parking lot onto Walnut Grove. <laughs> if we can find healthy ways and healthy outlets, then over time, we can tame our tongues not to hide our truth, but to speak our truth in ways that allow us to share it with love. We can use our words as blessing for building connections through gentleness and empathy. Sticks and stones and words can all be used to build up and not just to tear down. It all comes down to how we as God's people choose to use the gifts that we are given by the God who made each of us in His image. So let us pray together. God, you made us each in your image and you call us by name. Be with us as we learn to tame our tongues and to use our words as blessing and not as curse as we look at the world around us and learn and strive to speak our truth in love so that we may build your kingdom together on earth as it is in heaven. And may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at hopechurchmemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.